All right, hey guys, thank you very much for that. I appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us tonight. God bless you. And uh, we're going to talk about the occult, how it has infiltrated the modern church. And I want to play just a quick little video over here for you and show you some visuals of some of the things that I am talking about uh, as we get into this. So let me do this. Before we get started, I want to just start here from Isaiah chapter number 14 and give you just a little bit of information about Satan before we get into this very, uh, very interesting topic tonight. I, I want you to know something right off the bat about Satan is that um, everybody gets Satan wrong. Everybody misunderstands him. And if you don't really know your enemy's tactics, then you're going to be ineffective in combating what he's going to do against you. And so I want you to know this, that ever since the creation of the earth, Satan has been seeking to infiltrate and imitate everything that God has done. And we find the first words chronologically that Satan had ever said in the Bible, not canonically, but chronologically, we find his first words in Isaiah chapter 4. Uh, the Bible says here, For uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so we find there that Satan's plan has always been to try to be God. And so Satan really thinks that he should be king of the universe, uh, but that simply can't be so. And so in his anger and jealousy and wrath, uh, he's decided that if he could not be God, uh, then he would imitate and infiltrate everything that God does. And we dealt with this a lot in our third Adam documentary. And if you have not gone to see that, please, after this live stream tonight, uh, go ahead and see that. That's going to be a great uh, help for to you and help you understand this topic. I want, you, I want to say to you that God created mankind and put him in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And God creates the woman and puts uh, him with the man in the garden, thus creating the first family. And then Satan moves in and attacks the woman in Genesis chapter 3, uh, using three tactics that he has, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is his tactics. He's always been that way and really always will be that way. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God made, uh, had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That right there that you see, and especially Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, uh, God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as gods, good and evil. That's Satan's tactic. Uh, the phrase there being, you shall be as gods, is, uh, is really the appeal that Satan always has. And uh, you see here that mankind falls in the garden, and this is what I want you to notice, okay? This is something I want to say to you, and I want you to really get this. Um, there's two major lessons that you have to know about the Lord, two of them. Number one, that God loves His creation. There's no doubt in, the, in my mind at all that God loves people and that God loves His creation. But not only does God love His creation, God has lines for His creation, meaning that God has boundaries that He has given to mankind. And I want you to know that really, when it comes to really anything, any functional relationship that you have, uh, there are some sort of lines and some sort of boundaries. Uh, in, in a marriage, there's boundaries. In a friendship, there's boundaries. Uh, in a job, there's boundaries. I mean, if you have a job, a nine-to-five, uh, you have to go to work, and you can't be off working for somebody else and still maintain that job where you are. And all relationships really have boundaries. And so God created a boundary there in the Garden of Eden, and he said, you know, you can do anything through here. Go eat anything you want. But there's one tree I don't want you to touch. I don't want you to mess with that. And, you know, the phrase, thou shalt not, is still in the Bible, no matter what anybody says. And so if we're going to have a functional relationship with God like God intends, then we have to say no to some things. There's some things that are off limits for God's people that should be avoided and stayed away from at all costs. 
And so I want to say this, that really Satan's goal is to mess up everything that God has, to infiltrate and imitate in order to cause destruction and and misery and pain and to literally uh, condemn men unto a wicked end so that they don't trust Christ and all those things like that. That is Satan's job. He wants to deceive people. And in order to deceive people, he must blur those boundaries and those lines that God has created. Um, I want you to say, I want to say that in order for him to blur the lines and blur the boundaries, he must first blur the love of God. And I want you to know that in the Garden of Eden, uh, God loved Adam and Eve, even though they fell and even though they, uh, they messed up in sin and all that stuff. He loved them. Uh, but there was one tree there they couldn't eat, of course, and there we go, they, they fell. But what I'm saying today is that the love of God in the average church is being warped today. And because of the love of God being warped and distorted, the lines of God, the boundaries of God, are also being warped and distorted. I want you to know that almost every mention of God's love for sinners has some sort of connection to the fact that Jesus died for their sin. Now, I want to talk to you about the love of God for just a moment. God loves sinners. There's no doubt at all about that. And we're going to go to the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want you to know that every time when the Bible talks about God's love for sinners, it is always somehow connected to the fact that Jesus died for sinners. Uh, let's go also to Romans chapter number 5, if we will, and uh, look at these verses. Romans chapter number 5, and uh, we'll begin reading here in verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so I want to say this to you, that when a man comes to fully understand his position before God as sinful, wicked, abhorrent, and deserving of hell, then and only then can he look to Jesus on the cross with his arms spread out, bleeding from his head, his side, his feet, and then and only then can he really truly begin to understand the love of God. No man can fully understand the love of God and the work that Christ did upon the cross until he comes to understand his own personal sinfulness. This is why Jesus said that the work of the Holy Spirit in the coming age, the church age, would be to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and in judgment. I want you to see here in John chapter number 16 the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said when the Comforter would come. The Bible says, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of the wor of this world is judge. And so John 16 verse 8 through 11, Jesus said this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the coming age. This is the work of the Holy Spirit now. The Holy Spirit does not exist to make you feel good or to uh, give you some sort of euphoric experience. But the Holy Spirit exists to reprove of sin, righteousness, and of the judgment to come. I want to say that God's love in modern churches today, the love of God, has been subtly disconnected from the act of God sending His only begotten Son to die on the cross for mankind. And now, the love of God has been distorted. And now... God loves mankind just because God just loves and that's just it. Sinners today are not being told that God loves them by sending His Son to die for them, but rather that God loves them because God is just cool like that. You know, God's just awesome. He's a, he just loves everybody. That's just how God is. God just loves everyone unconditionally and indiscriminately all the time, no matter what, just because God is awesome. And that is the message of today, which is not a Bible message. Some churches today are even saying that God loves you and that sinners are actually even deserving of that love. There was a woman named Amanda Lindsay Cook. We did a video on her a while back. She is a uh, very prominent singer with Bethel Church out there in Redding, California. And Amanda Lindsay Cook is um, 
on Twitter. She doesn't do much on there. But on August 25th, 2019, a uh, church here in Louisville actually retweeted one of her sayings on Twitter. And the saying actually went like this. My hope, and I'm quoting Amanda Lindsay Cook, <clears throat> my hope would be that we discover along with the love of a kind and good God, our own worthiness of that love. Because we were designed for it, we were created for it. I want to tell you today that one of the most beautiful things about the love of God is the fact that you don't deserve the love of God. Nobody on this planet deserved for Jesus to die on the cross for them. Nobody on this planet deserved to be saved. Nobody deserves that. You don't deserve the love of God. And that's the beauty of it is that God gave his love anyway, even though we didn't deserve it. And I want to say that in the modern churches now, that the things that are happening now in these modern institutions calling themselves churches, God is not the high and lifted up king of the universe that has been dread, dreadfully provoked by our willful, vile, and heinous sin that, uh, that demonstrated his love by sending his only begotten son to die a horrible death on the cross for all mankind, for all who would believe. God's not that anymore. God is now some cool dude that thinks you're pretty cool too and would love to chill together as cool dudes sometime because that's just what cool dudes do and that's just what God is. He's not the king of the universe. He's just the homie upstairs. And that's how they're teaching God to be today. <clears throat> I want to say that um, God's love has been warped in the average church and because there's been a new definition of the love of God, then naturally there has to be a new definition of the lines of God. God's love and God's lines are being perverted in churches today. I want to say that God's lines has uh, been perverted, and now God, of course, is just some homeboy in the sky. But when God's lines, the things that God says are acceptable and not acceptable, when those lines are changed, then uh, the things that are considered acceptable in the Christian life are changed as well. Most people don't know this, but there was a time in American history when the Protestants, headed up by men like former professional baseball player turned Presbyterian evangelist Billy Sunday, petitioned the United States government for the abolition of liquor, and they accomplished it. Now churches today are having beer and hymns on Sunday night. And there was a time in American culture when profanity and cursing was not allowed on the television set. But now we have famous songs by Christian groups like Hillsong United that have women singing and cursing in the lyrics. There was a time where profanity and cursing were not allowed on the radio of American radio stations. But now, right now, we have preachers standing up in pulpits and they're cussing and don't even care. I want to say that the lines of God have been warped. And uh, I want to say that God, when he was in the garden there with Adam and Eve, he told them, he said, you know, here's some things that we got going on and I don't want, you can do anything you want here, but don't touch that one thing. There's a line there. And I want to say that God has always put lines between certain things and his people. I want to say that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, God told them, even in the book of Leviticus and things of that nature, I don't want you messing with soothsayers and witchcraft and sorcery and astrology and those of that nature. There's so many verses in Deuteronomy to Leviticus. God put a line between the dark arts of the world and his people. I want to say also in the New Testament church that God has put a line between his people and false teachers. I want you to notice uh, that in Matthew chapter number 7, and uh, by the way, Matthew chapter 7, everybody talks about judge not, that you be not judged, and that's all that they know. But they, they certainly don't go down to verse number 15 and talk about beware of false prophets would come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They don't like to talk about that. They only stop at verse number one just because it certainly suits their interest. But God's saying there's false teachers out there and there needs to be a line between you and the false teachers. Not only that, in the, uh, in the New Testament there, in the New Testament church at Corinth, God told these people through the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 that there's idolatry in the world. And by the way, idolatry is a form of pag uh, paganism and witchcraft and things of that nature. And in verse number 16, he tells them, he said, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
and idols is where all the paganism of, the day, of that day was going on. He says, For you are the temple of the living God. If God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That is the line that God says and puts between his people and witchcraft, paganism, and the occult. I want to say also there, in the, even in the book of Revelation, there's going to be tribulation saints that will go through the tribulation, and I believe they'll live through it and uh, go on. But in Revelation chapter 18, God speaks about the judgment of Babylon. And he says there in verse number 4, the Bible says clearly, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And uh, so God is going to judge this, and the Lord's people are commanded here, come out of her, stay away from her, get away from that. And so that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that I believe the occult, because of people refusing to obey the lines and boundaries that God has placed for his people, they have allowed this type of stuff to come into the church. I want to give you a couple areas that I believe the local New Testament church has been infiltrated by occultism and by the works of Satan. I want to say the first area that I believe that the local church has been infiltrated is number one in the teachings of the church. I want you to know that many churches today have adopted a hyper positive approach to ministry they're always smiling they're always happy they just to them the greatest sin that could be committed was just to put a frown on your face and that's certainly not biblical and these churches because of their hyper positive approach to ministry they've adopted the concept that quote if we think positive then we can experience positive things this concept is very popular today in the self-help world where books like think and grow rich and books like the law of attraction are basically flying off the self shelf and even all these years later are still best sellers but i want you to give you a little dirty secret about the law of attraction and things like think and grow rich these books are nothing more than a western form of eastern mysticism that's all they are i want to tell you that uh, I, i've been i had a great conversation this week with a former yoga teacher that got saved and taught me a little bit about this stuff very interesting stuff that they're doing uh, but yoga is the idea that um, we are supposed to raise our consciousness. We are we have a low consciousness, but a spiritual awakening needs to happen in us called raising your consciousness. And uh, this is this raising of the consciousness is done through yoga exercises and meditation. And they teach that when man was in the garden in Genesis chapter number three, when man fell in the garden. They believed that God, that mankind had a very high consciousness and probably even the highest level of consciousness. And they operated a very high frequency. And that when they fell, that frequency dropped. But through yoga and through meditation, Eastern mysticism, we can raise back up this frequency. And those whose bodies give off a higher frequency are closer to God than those whose frequencies are lower. Yoga teaches that our thoughts, whether positive or negative, impact the frequency that our body emits through an electromagnetic field. And if we emit positive energy through this field, then positive things can happen to us. And if we emit negative things through this field, then negative things will happen to us. That is the law of attraction. If you think good things, then good things will happen. But I want you to know that, believe it or not, this exact same concept is being taught in churches today. The reason that most people cannot spot it is because it's glossed over with a veneer of Christian vocabulary. And men like Joel Osteen often preach this very concept. I want to read to you a quote. Actually, I've got three quotes right here from Joel Osteen. I want to read these, these quotes from him. He says this, You will produce what you're continually seeing in your mind. If that's not Eastern mysticism, I don't know what is. And by the way, be, be careful about these guys like Kenneth Copeland that talk about your mind's eye. That is nothing more than New Age mystical crazy stuff. Joel Osteen said, you will, you will produce what you're continually seeing in your mind. If you develop an image of victory, success, health, abundance, joy, peace, and happiness, nothing on earth 
will be able to hold those things from you. That's the law of attraction. That's what he's preaching. He says, start anticipating promotions and supernatural increase. You must conceive it in your heart and mind before you can receive it. You must make room for increasing for increase in your own thinking, and then God will bring those things to pass. That is nothing more than a glossed over, repackaged, rehashed with a veneer of Christianity over it form of Eastern mystical yoga teaching. That's all that is. Joel Osteen also said, when you think positive, excellent thoughts, you will be propelled towards greatness. Inevitably, inevitably bound for increase, promotion, and God's supernatural blessing. I want to say also that another example of this is found in the what we call the New Apostolic Reformation churches of today. They um, they don't say it that it's yoga or whatever. Their mode of operation is that if you want something, then just decree it and declare it, and it will be so. Many times as you watch maybe a Bethel singer, and by the way, all these clips that I'm showing are Jesus Image, Stephanie Gretzinger, Bethel Church, and New Apostolic Reformation worship churches, which are basically the hotbed. Look at all that. That's just nuts what's going on right there. And that's an actual music video uh, from that woman. But many times in the middle of a performance like this here at Bethel Church, they will stop and many of the women will just say, if you believe God can do this, then just decree and declare and prophesy over it. And many of you have heard that. I want to say that this is nothing more than a Westerner teaching, a yoga, New Age Hindu teaching, and using the language of Christianity to do so. Another area that I believe the local churches of today have been infiltrated by the occult, not only in the preaching of the church, but also in the practices of the church. And there are several ways by which this is being done, but I believe one of the most popular ones right now is something called the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a, uh, is a symbol that many people have seen, and I'm sure many of you folks have, uh, have seen that and are, are familiar with what that is. Um, I'm going to pull up a picture of one so that I can have it ready for you. But the Enneagram is oftentimes used as a personality test. Here's a picture of it right there. And uh, this is what a website said about the Enneagram. They said that this is a system of personality typing that describes patterns and how people interpret the world and manage their emotions. The Enneagram de describes nine different personality types and maps each of these types onto a nine-pointed diagram that helps to illustrate how the types relate to one another. The name Enneagram comes from the Greek Enea, and which is the word for nine, and gramma, meaning something that's drawn or written. So nine drawn or written things is what they say the Enneagram is. But the truth is that is only the uh, surface definition, the consumer for public consumption definition. But those who have some spiritual discernment know that there is something more to this. This is not a personality test. This is an esoteric tool defined to help you know yourself. And that phrase, know yourself, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 and point you and remind you of what Satan said to Eve. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be, be as gods, knowing good and evil. The phrase, know yourself, has to do with that saying. I want to say that the Enneagram was invented by a man named George Gur Gurdjieff. And he was born in Russia in the early 20th century, and despite his family's desires for him to become an Orthodox priest, he traveled the world to learn Eastern mysticism, occultism, and New Age teachings. He found a group of Sufi mystics out there, and which are basically Muslim hippies in Turk Turkestan, and taught them the secret of sacred geometry. And they taught him the secret of sacred geometry. And from this knowledge, he developed the Enneagram. And Gerda Jeff moves to Paris in the 1920s and taught what was called esoteric Christianity at the time. And by the way, Satan's tactics are never, never, the, I mean, he, he does the same thing every, every generation. Back then they were calling it esoteric Christianity. Today they're just calling it Christian rock and roll. He's doing the same thing. And these teachings flourished all throughout Europe and the United States. And uh, he opened up another school in America eventually. One use of the Enneagram is uh, there, like he said there, you sh your eyes shall be open, which, by the way, this is a form of Gnosticism, mysticism, and occultism. And the Enneagram being Gnosticism, mysticism, and occultism is being openly practiced, promoted, 
And a lot of churches are even preaching the Enneagram from their pulpits today. So not only in the practices of the church and the teachings and preachings of the church, but I believe that the occult has infiltrated the church today in the worship of the church. I want to say that the modern church has abandoned the hymns of the past to accommodate a new sound. They say times have changed and the music must change too. And I want to say that this is the thought process of the average Laodicean pragmatist that doesn't fully understand the immutability of God. And the fact that although times do change, the need of fallen man remains the same. These end-time pragmatists have catered to the carnal whims of those in the pews who have, fought, who have allowed a, a musical style that pleases the flesh of the people instead of the person of the Holy Spirit. They have quenched and grieved the Holy Spirit so much that He has withdrawn Himself from most churches. And in that vacuum, when the Holy Ghost moved out, something had to come in. And there was another spirit that came in. This spirit in the Eastern world, that uh, this spirit that came into the churches, is called Kundalini in the Eastern world. And this spirit gives an intense religious euphoria to those that embrace it. Many people that embrace this spirit can be seen doing erratic body gestures, shaking, and even convulsing. And I've got a video of Stephanie Gretzinger at Jesus Image doing that, and I'll play that, and we'll, we'll show that to you here just a little bit. But I want to tell you today that uh, we have, there's a group of generation of people that have risen up, and they are just basically pragmatic. They want to know what works rather than what is right before God. And I believe that when these churches are doing these concerts that you see here, these, uh, these where they're swaying and all the things that are going on, and you see a lot of, I put Sean Foyt's revivals out there, you see all these people swaying and all that. And then most of them, well, a degree of them, after that, they'll go smile and laugh and have a good little time in their church. And then afterwards, they'll go drink a beer with their friends and hang out in the nightclubs and live just like the rest of the world. That's Kundalini. It's a false spirit, and it's not of God. I want to say this to you guys in conclusion. I, I believe that there are many people in the upcoming days, many people that due to the turbulent nature politically of the world and all the things that are happening, you and I know these things very well. I believe that there's going to be a group of people coming in the very near future that are, may be seeking God. And my fear is that, that in their desire to learn more about God, they're going to walk into a building with a steeple on top of it and the word church will be on the front door. And they'll go in there and they'll open themselves up to whatever happens inside of that building. But sadly, many of them will be walking into a church where they have allowed Satan to warp the love of God. And they have warped the lines of God. And now the occult is openly being practiced in these buildings. Many people will embrace this false spirit, become woke, get euphoric highs every week. And uh, they will use esoteric tools like the Enneagram. And they will adopt, eventually they'll adopt a political leftist ideology, which is always going to be the case. And then they're going to live out their days in a church like that. And then they're going to die and go to hell at the end of the road. And guys, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that somebody would want to seek the Lord and want to hear the gospel and then go into the wrong kind of church. Guys, I can't live with that. I can't live with that. There was a story that I read a while back by D.L. Moody, and D.L. Moody was, of course, in the late 1800s when his ministry was, and there was a, there was a trains were being built across the United States of America, and there was a terrible accident. Two passenger trains collided head-on, both of them full of passengers, and when the rescue workers got there, they found one of the engineers, one of the men conducting that train, and he was laying there and his body was broken, and he's laying there clutching a piece of paper. And as he died, they, they heard him say over and over again, somebody, somebody gave me the wrong schedule. Somebody gave me the wrong schedule. Somebody gave me the wrong schedule. And he died. And I want to tell you, church, and folks that are watching, there's going to be a lot of people in hell. A lot of people in the flames of hell that are going to say, somebody gave me the wrong schedule. 
Somebody told me wrong about God. Somebody told me that if I just joined the church and, you know, listened to this music and got filled with the Holy Ghost and whatever, that if I just did these things, then I would be okay. And really, they were, they were told wrong. I want to tell you that these people that are going to walk into these churches, they, they, they got to get the truth. And churches like this, they're not going to give them the truth. Not at all. It's a shame. And I, I want to just say this to you guys right here, to the folks that are listening. I believe that it is time that those who know the truth about these people start to speak out about it. And I think we need to expose the Bill Johnsons, the Hill Songs, the Joel Osteens, the Kenneth Copelands, the Heidi Bakers, the, the Todd Whites, the Stephen Furtick's, the Francis Chans, the T.D. Jakes, the Lauren Daigles of the world, the Pat Robertsons, the Creflo Dollars, the Andy Stanleys, the Benny Hens, the Paula Whites, the Rick Warrens, and all of these other false teachers that are teaching a false gospel and preaching a false Jesus, I think they need to be called out and exposed for who they are. Forget about being kind and manners in a time like this. These people are feeding folks theological poison. They need to be exposed for the criminals they are. I also believe it's time that, that we call out those who, although they don't believe like these heretics, they fellowship with and endorse these heretics Men like John Piper, who fellowship with false teachers like Lecrae and Beth Moore and Crowder at the Passion Conference every year. I believe those guys need to be called out. I also believe guys like Casting Crowns, who, although they seem to be orthodox, they fellowship with and endorse false teachers like Bill Johnson at Bethel, Carl Lentz at Hillsong, and another one called Amanda Lindsay Cook, the lady at Bethel Church. I believe that it's time that we as Christians obey 1 Peter 5, 8, where the Bible commands us to be sober and be vigilant so that we can know the tactics that Satan uses today. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I think that it's time that we quit exalting the, the euphoric high we get from sensual pop music with Christian words above the cleansing power of the Word of God. I believe that it's time we desire to be spiritually clean more than we desire to be spiritually high, which is what you guys are trying to do. This stuff is a drug. This stuff that you're looking at right here, this is a drug for people. They, they go from high to high to high, and they can't live without it, and it's not worship. It's euphoric Kundalini, false Holy Ghost. This, this is the work of the devil. And I want to say that we need to desire to be spiritually clean more than we desire to be spiritually high. I think it's time that we wake up and realize that there are incredible nefarious forces working overtime to subvert our churches, our nations, and our homes, and that we must be on guard now more than ever before. I want to say this also. I think it's time that preachers stop being a bunch of sissies and get a spiritual backbone and stand behind the pulpit and call sin for what it is. It's sin. I think it's time that we stop being vague about the wickedness of today and start calling things by name. I think that it's time that preachers stop fearing losing people, paychecks, and popularity and start worrying about fearing God instead of men. Some preachers today are such cowards that they are willing to let a whole generation be swallowed up by occultism, mysticism, and Gnosticism because if they speak out, they may offend somebody. I say, you're not polite. You're not a, you're not a nice guy. You're a coward is what you are. You're a little coward. And your little excuse of why I didn't want to offend nobody, that's not going to work at the judgment seat of Christ. I doubt it very much. And I want to say also, I, th I think it's time that the people in the pews of the churches stop living in ignorance of the Scriptures and start digging into the Bible yourself. Start reading the book. Start reading the Bible. Start knowing the Word of God to where you can quote it and say it. And I think it's time that every Christian develop their own personal prayer time and Bible study time. 
I think it's time that we stop living off of what is, what is running out of another man's cup and ask God to fill our cup, my cup, every once in a while. I think that it's time that we ask God to reveal himself to us as God's people in the scriptures fresh and anew. And then get up and read this blessed old Bible until we can speak it, quote it, and know it like the back of our hand. I want to say that I, I think also, I think it's time that we throw certain wicked music out of our churches. I want to say that again. I think it's time that we throw certain wicked music out of our churches. And I think it's time that we stop trying to take the music of, wistic, of, of wicked, mystical, unsaved church groups like Hillsong and trying to put them on the piano and tame them down just a little bit so that it's okay. I want you to, I want you to hear me. Poison is still poison even if you dilute it. Poison is still poison even if you dilute it. It's still going to kill you if you drink enough of it. And I think it's time that we stop as God's people looking to thought leaders of today for the new trendy thing and start looking to the past like men on my wall there, Sam P. Jones, and start looking to the past for something that God has honored and used. I think it's time that we trade the Billy Sunday, or excuse me, we trade the Billy Grahams for the Billy Sundays. I think it's time that we trade the Joel Osteens for the John Owens. And I think it's time we trade the Stephen Furtick's for the Charles Spurgeons. And I think it's time we trade the Paula Whites for the Apostle Paul. And I think it's time that we trade Joyce Myers for George Mueller. We don't need to find out what's trendy and do that. We need to find out what's biblical and do that. And if we don't do that, then what's going to happen to our generation is that we're going to be the people that fulfill a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says here in the Bible, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What is a seducing spirit and doctrines of devils look like? Well, I don't know if I can give you every example of what it looks like every time. But I want to tell you, I think it looks something like this. I think it looks like mystical women getting up and giving occult symbolism, all kinds of nonsense in their churches. I think this is what that looks like. Doctrines of devils. And why? Why are they doing this? Why do they believe this way? It's because they've departed from the faith. They're speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And I want to tell you that our job today is to get back to doctrine, not to go for what's trendly, trendy and do that, but go to what's biblical and do that. The Bible says if a good minister... It describes one here, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And then also says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself rather than to godliness. We all need that. But I want to tell you today that we need to get back to doctrine. We don't need to go with what trendy, what's trendy. I believe that the modern church today has, in the name of pragmatism, in the name of trying to be trendy, trying to be hip, trying to be cool, we have literally asked God to leave and we have allowed Satan to come in. And by the way, this, this Sean Foych guy that everybody's talking about now, he's been on Fox News and everything like that, and basically what he's trying to do, I've just got a little video of their little concert here. Basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to go to where all these demonstrations were and he's trying to have a revival right in the middle of that but the thing is i think i think him doing that and going to those places i think that's on purpose because satan's already working there and it's a false dichotomy satan's playing both sides the yin and the yang he's playing the good and the bad and i want to say that i'm not for all of that antifa and all that stuff that's going on from the political left but the political right wing is pretending to be this and i want to tell you they're just as much a part of satan's work as the other side is
Neither one of these people are of God. And that's how Satan gets us. He gets us by playing both sides, the yin and the yang. What's going to keep your family out of this? What is going to keep you away from this stuff? Well, what I can tell you, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We gave that verse a minute ago. I'll give it to you again. The Bible says here, to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That word sober in the Bible is a very interesting word. This is actually the last mention of it in the scripture, which is significant. Being sober means to take this seriously. Take this seriously. And if you don't take your walk with God, your church attendance, you, you if you don't take this stuff seriously, then don't be surprised if Satan, Satan sneaks up on you and devours your family. This is not a life and death scenario. This is bigger than that. This is eternal life and eternal death. This is your soul we're talking about here. And this matters because who God is matters because doctrine matters. And that's where I stand on that. So help me God. We've got several things we want to talk about to you. Don't go away. We're going to talk about Gnosticism here in a few minutes. And matter of fact, uh, let me just give this to you real fast before we go uh, on our quick little break here. But you folks who saw this video that I did the other day, uh, have we reached a new low in Christian music? That young man and I spoke on the phone today, and I want to share my burden with, uh, with you about him. And uh, we talked for a little while. And I want, to, I want to give you guys some important information that's going to warn you because this is just the beginning. There's going to be many more just like him in the future. And you need to be equipped and prepared to deal with them when they show up at your church. Not if, but when. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. And don't go away. God bless you guys. We will be right back. Hey guys, your friend Spencer here. The Lord has blessed our ministry in Kenya and we try to do many things to raise money for it. And one of the ways we do that is we have a store on Teespring where we just make uh, designs for Christian shirts and things like that and try to make that available for you to purchase. I have several neat designs in front of me. I've got our Spurgeon shirt that everybody seems to like. And then I also have the, I survived the toilet paper crisis of 2020. That's a favorite one that a lot of people have, but our all time bestseller right now is I can do all things through a verse out of context. All of these are available in our Teespring store and you can see the link below to get that. We also have several new designs. One of our new ones that just came out is Church is Essential. And uh, you can get one of those shirts and all of that goes to help fund our operation and our ministry in Kenya as well. And so we thank God for you guys getting on there and getting a shirt and it just helps us and is a blessing to us. So check it out today, our Teespring store. And God bless you guys, and we'll see you again before too long. Thank you very much. Hey guys, your friend Spencer here. I've got exciting news about our new book, From Football to Faith. It is now available on Amazon.com. All you have to do is click the link below. It'll take you to Amazon's website, and you can get your own copy sent to your front door and uh, that will be a blessing. Uh, in this book, I gave my testimony of how I came to know Christ as my Savior and a lot of the character lessons that I learned playing football that are applicable to the Christian life. And you'll find many good stories in here that are funny, some that are sad, some that are uh, inspirational, but I'm sure this book will be a blessing to you. Christians young and old will enjoy this book and I know that it'll be a blessing to you. So go ahead and get your copy today and we appreciate you guys. And if you haven't done this already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel and look forward to many more good videos together in the future. God bless you, friend. Have a good day. Hey guys, your friend Spencer here. A couple years ago, the Lord laid on my heart to do some research into the contemporary Christian music world, and I was astounded at, at what I found. I just found so many unbelievably unbiblical things, even some demonic things that were happening. And the Lord led me to put all that into a book form, and this is the book we have written, Calling Evil Good, The Live Christian Rock and Roll. And as far as books that are dealing with the negative and the dangerous aspects of contemporary Christian music, this book right now is the number one seller as of the time of the recording 
sharing this video. And so uh, we want to put this out there and let you know about this book. Uh, this book will be shipped to your front door by Amazon. And we've had so many good reports from all over the world, really, of uh, people saying that, man, this book really opened up my eyes to the truth of this entire industry. And we deal with people like Hulk Hogan, Britney Spears, Beyonce, uh, Amy Grant, Alice Cooper, Elvis Presley, Larry Norman, R. Kelly, Puff Daddy, and all the record companies really all together. We deal with the, the whole big spectrum. So get your copy today. There's a link in the description below. And I know this book will help you understand the issue better and understand why this is an issue. So God bless you, friend. Hope you enjoyed the book. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and look forward to many good updates with you in the future. God bless you.